Welcome to the Waiting Room Evolution. On this episode, we talk with Dr. Alyssa Campbell. She's a geriatrician and palliative care physician, and also the president of Palliative Care Western Australia. We discuss several hot topics related to improving care for those facing serious illness from her perspective practicing in Western Australia. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Oh. Alyssa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Good to meet you. We're very excited nice. to have different perspectives, especially from Western Australia, Per, Maybe we can start with why you got into geriatrics and focused a little bit on palliative care? Yeah, so when I was, I guess, a final year medical student, I did a term of palliative care. It was a one-week term um, where I was based in an inpatient palliative care unit, a hospice um, called Cottage Hospice that sadly is no longer there. Um, but I was really, um, I guess, touched by how um, palliative care seemed to really aim to improve quality of life and um, create a, a good death for people. And I just thought, what a lovely specialty to be able to do that. Um, and then so as a um, resident medical officer, um, I did another term of palliative care and continued to enjoy it. I also really enjoyed doing geriatric medicine. I think similarly to palliative care, it's a very holistic specialty. Um, the focus is very much on quality of life, um, doing common sense decision making, along with patients and their families um, that aligns with their values um, and treating a person as a whole um, and as a whole as part of a family and a community um, rather than just treating one organ or one disease. Um, and then I guess I couldn't really choose which specialty I wanted to train in, so I did both. I, I know we met through Twitter, I guess, really, and... Um, you've heard a little bit about, you know, the waiting revolution and our podcast. So I'd love to hear some of just, you know, your thoughts of how that intersects with some of what's happening on your side of the world. Um, I really like um, the approach, particularly in the first season, I guess, of um, from the perspective of the person experiencing, um, I guess, a life limiting illness with palliative care needs and then their families and how to approach that. Um, I think we're seeing that's a really big gap. Um, here and I chair a not-for-profit peak body palliative care WA um, which is our peak body here in Western Australia and very fortunate to work with organizations like Carers WA which is a peak body for carers and Health Consumers Council um, in trying to improve um, a palliative care approach from the perspective of you know the person who's receiving palliative care um, and their carers rather than from the medical perspective, which is obviously what I'm used to and what the healthcare system is often um, geared towards the healthcare workers rather than the people receiving healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's really important. And we try with all our work with Palliative Care WA to have the voice of lived experience, um, whether that's in our sort of public events um, or in written um, documents or meetings with um, ministers and policymakers. It's interesting because, you know, in my training, we always felt that certain countries were doing it better than us. It, you know, the UK, Spain, and Australia. It, it, you know, Australia has this reputation for doing, in quotations, it better palliative care. Is it well integrated into care from the time of diagnosis of a progressive illness threaded through the journey in a way that the patients and families don't even know they're getting it from every doctor and every nurse without ever being labeled? Um, unfortunately, in short, no. <laughs> um, and not as much as we'd like it to be. And I know there was that economist report a few years back that put um, Australia as number two for palliative care, um, second to the UK. 
And WA, or Western Australia, the state that I'm in, has been seen as an exemplar in some areas, such as community palliative care, where we have an organisation called Silver Chain that provides community palliative care to the entire metropolitan region, which is uh, about 80% of the population of Western Australia does live in Perth, our capital city, despite being a vast state geographically. Um, but unfortunately, I think that we are missing the boat when it comes to early implementation of palliative care. And I think that um, although we've had huge investment in palliative care in the last few years, um, when we've had voluntary assisted dying introduced in our state, we had big increases in palliative care funding to go along with that. But I do think that um, as demand for palliative care has grown, the palliative care services are more and more stretched and therefore the focus tends to be on the end of life and very much the last days, weeks or sometimes months um, rather than implementation from the time of diagnosis, which is what um, ideally we'd like to see and I guess where we see the greatest benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you say palliative care um, and you know, there are certain areas that are do are exemplar areas. Does most of the palliative care still fall on the shoulders of palliative care specialty teams? Um, I think that's changing. So um, Palliative Care Australia, which is our national peak body, which um, I think you had Mira Agar, the president on yeah. the podcast earlier in the year. Um, so Palliative Care Australia has recently uh, released standards for palliative care from non-specialist services. So um, I think it's called, I should know this, palliative care from um, health and aged care services. But essentially, they're standards for any health service that isn't a specialist palliative care service. Um, and we're certainly trying to grow that capacity, knowing that, you, you know, specialist palliative care can't do it all for everyone we just don't have the workforce um, and not everyone has those complex needs that require specialist palliative care. So do you as a geriatrician and a palliative care specialist sometimes um, people uh, ask me well what's the difference between being a palliative care doctor and a, um, a geriatrician? So I usually tell people that actually there's a lot of overlap uh, but mm -hmm. there are some things that maybe are a little bit different. My day job is as a geriatrician working mainly in acute geriatric medicine. So I don't do any specialist palliative care. Um, and I think that geriatric medicine certainly embraces the palliative approach to care. Mm -hmm. um, and for many um, patients, the geriatrician can like will be managing them from the time of diagnosis, for example, with dementia, um, and potentially through to the end of life. And that's where we have the opportunity for a palliative care approach there. Um, I think that both specialties still have a lot to learn from each other mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, when I did my palliative care training, we didn't sort of spend a huge amount of time learning about palliative care for people with dementia or movement disorders or frailty. And um, in geriatric medicine, again, there's no spe um, specific curriculum around some of the specialist palliative care um, topics, but there are many, in, particularly in my state in WA, actually, either geriatricians who are dual training with palliative care or who are doing a diploma of palliative medicine. And so getting a six month um, experience in doing a diploma that way and really increasing their skills. And our two specialty societies here, so the Australian New Zealand Society for Palliative Medicine and the Australian New Zealand Society for Geriatric Medicine um, are currently working on a joint position statement on palliative mm -hmm. care for older people. So mm -hmm. it's certainly a growing area. Yeah. yeah and I, I had a look and I think that um, I was looking at Canada and the numbers of geriatricians and in Australia and New Zealand, we have a lot more. Mm. Um, I think there's about 300 in Canada and about 1,350 in Australia and New Zealand from what I could see. Mm. And um, the population here is smaller. So we've, we've certainly got a lot more per capita. Mm -hmm. You know, as a palliative care doctor, I span all age groups. 
But the majority yeah. of the people that I see are certainly over 65. Um, when you think about, you know, heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, uh, maybe neurologic diseases, um, often people are a little bit younger, but still frailty and dementia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, they're mo most of them are senior. Uh, mm. So it makes a lot of sense that the two specialties would come up with some position statement uh, because every single solitary elderly person is going to die. I hope our listeners aren't shocked by that, <laughs> but a hundred percent of them will pass away and most won't pass away from a sudden death. They'll pass away from something or a combination of things that were progressive and life limiting from the time they got the diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. And they, and most people are older when they die, which is a wonderful thing. It's a yeah. success of modern medicine. I wanted to ask you, Alyssa, specifically about the gaps you see in providing palliative care to dementia patients and families. And is this gap mostly in nursing homes? Or I know they're sometimes called aged care homes or long-term care homes. Oh, I think it's across the entire um, span of disease with, um, for people with dementia from the time of diagnosis through to bereavement and the traditional palliative care models that we have, which are based on, I guess, the traditional um, trajectories of people dying from cancer, um, which kind of have more intensive care right at the end of life they're not suited towards um, people with dementia. And I think that there's an opportunity um, from the time of diagnosis with advanced care planning, really helping people to live well, um, you know, and we don't need that same intensive sort of palliative care model um, that we, we traditionally have. Um, but I think there's opportunities throughout the disease trajectory, such as, you know, when, um, somebody loses their ability to drive, for example, or gives up their driving, you know, um, when they may need to start having um, assistance in the home with, um, you know, carers coming in to assist with things like shopping or cleaning. And then, yes, near the end of life, they may transition into residential care, as we call it here, residential aged care facilities. Um, and that's another prompt. Um, and I just think that the traditional model of palliative care that we have that everyone is used to that came out of the um, modern hospice movement focusing on people with cancer um, doesn't suit people with dementia. Mm. And so I'm, that's what I'm really interested in, seeing models from elsewhere around the world that I can potentially bring back to Australia. Um, and I think that public health palliative care probably is going to have a big um, input in that um, because the health system can't do it all um, and it's probably not appropriate for the health system to do it all I mean people are in the community and, and probably want that support from members of the community um, outside of healthcare. You're right I mean um, with other illness models uh intensity of medical care increases and it's like a sprint until the end and so um lots of services uh, people bouncing in and out of er's and hospital and you know all of a sudden intense caregiver needs but with the dementia story it's true there's more instead of intense medicine and medical treatments there's intense need for caregiver support uh, along the way and respite and, um, you know, a break from care and intense conversations around place of care planning. Um, the intensity is really not acute intensity. It's just this long marathon of most families not knowing what to expect. How long am I going to be in this caregiver role? When am I going to catch a break? How do I catch my breath? How do I sustain this long journey? Um, it's, it's a very different feel, like you say, than the ramping up intensity of someone with stage four cancer who's become advanced. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to all your investigative work so that you can enlighten us how we can do this better. So many people have dementia. Mm. 
And I think, yeah, unfortunately, we do sort of see that ramping up of medical treatments at the end of life as well. Um, and there's certainly local research from um, WA even and recently published, I think, a systematic review out of the UK showing that as well, that um, people with dementia in, you know, in the last year of life, they're really using a lot more um, health services. And, and the problem is we don't know whether that's aligned with their values or their wishes um, for the most part, because we're generally not doing adequate advanced care planning, um, not mm -hmm. necessarily doing the supported decision making and having mm -hmm. the discussions with people with dementia. There's just an assumption that they'll get put in an ambulance, come to hospital, mm -hmm. you know, have their aspiration pneumonia treated, which may mm -hmm. well be very appropriate, but um, the discussion should have been had with the person about what their wishes would be in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many people, um, the intensity of medical care increases because everything is considered acute and sudden and not planned for, uh, and people are reactive and everything feels like a crisis because like you said, there wasn't this nice, calm discussion about how this illness is going to unfold. What are the likely hurdles that are going to come your way as a patient, a family, or a care setting, anticipating that that's going to happen. It's not if it happens, it's going to happen. Swallowing is going to become more challenging. What are we going to do at that point? What are the goals of care? What are your wishes? And there's so many things we can do to turn the intensity around just by information sharing and helping people be more woke about what is normal here, right? Yeah, I think there's a big education gap there. And I think, um, I'm sure it's the same in Canada. It seems to be a, a worldwide issue in healthcare at the moment that you know, healthcare is just really under the pump and there's a massive shortage of healthcare workers. And, you know, we see in the acute hospitals, the focus is very much on discharging patients so that we can get the next one in, you know, who, who out of the emergency department. And that doesn't allow an, a lot of opportunity for those um, discussions about what's going to happen next time. Um, it's really about just getting you better, getting you out, getting you home. Mm -hmm. um, and not having the opportunity for those discussions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, it's really, yeah. yeah. I know you also have um, a blog website called Palaverse. So I don't know, tell us a little bit about what that's about and why you created it. Oh, so Palaverse, oh gosh, it's probably been around um, almost 10 years now. And it was a joint venture between seven um, palliative care doctors, um, researchers, nurses across um, Australia and New Zealand. And I think we saw a gap there in social media for palliative care. Um, and it was a community of practice really to bring together clinicians, researchers, um, community members to raise conversation about palliative care. And it's gotten a bit quieter in recent years as I think that other social media platforms have really, you know, become more popular and other um, people have taken up the the job of promoting palliative care, but the core group of Palliverse um, founders, I still keep in touch with them. They're all extremely active still in their areas of research and clinical practice and, you know, leading national committees and all of that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it was great. We used to do a monthly tweet chat, um, hashtag Palans where we talked about different palliative care topics. Um, we live tweeted quite a few conferences back in the day mm -hmm. um, just to really, I guess, grow the social media presence of palliative care, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And certainly I would say compared to geriatric medicine, um, it has a much, much bigger um, social media profile, which is great for palliative care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we've been working so hard with Waiting Revolution to sort of um, demystify dying, to sort of maybe change people's association with palliative care only mm. being about death and dying. And I guess it sounds like a lot of the things you're talking about, it's about living well for the whole journey. So I don't know, do you have any advice or experiences of, of have, do you feel like you've been able to shift that conversation or maybe in Australia, 
you know, there have been other external factors that have supported that. But is palliative care still really thought of as something that's used at the end of life? I think it, it still is. It's certainly improved in the, I guess, 10 years since I started my advanced training in palliative medicine. Um, but there's still a long way to go. I definitely encounter colleagues a lot, um, not so much within geriatric medicine, but definitely within um, the hospitals. And when I say palliative care, they, they think of that as synonymous with dying the last few days of, of life. Um, and I'm constantly, you know, having to say, no, this is a this is an approach that's relevant from the time of diagnosis with life limiting illness and explaining that when I'm talking about palliative care, I'm not talking about just the last few days, although that's very important. I'm, I'm talking about a longer course of care. Um, and I think in the community as well, we're still seeing um, we're seeing growing um, awareness of palliative care, but there still, again, is a misconception amongst a lot of people that it just means dying. You know, mm -hmm. other people will say, oh, yeah, my mum was put into palliative care, um, meaning that, you know, they went to hospice or they were, they were imminently dying. Um, but I think um, with groups like Palliative Care WA, we're doing a huge amount of work to change the community um, perception of palliative care and healthcare workers are part of the community. So the more we can get that message out there, um, the more healthcare workers will um, pick up on it as well. And it's really fantastic when you have um, patients or patients' families who are, you know, going to their health providers and requesting palliative care because they're more switched on about it than mm. their healthcare providers are sometimes. Uh, our journey, um, CN and my journey, is from the vantage point of end-of-life care uh, because that's as much as we have espoused more upstream uh, approach to palliative care, we're all really working at end of life. Um, so philosophically, we try to sell it upstream, but mm -hmm. when it comes to our practices in research and in clinical practice, it's really a lot about end of life care. And all of us, including you, Alyssa, and the people in Australia sound like we're trying to move that dial more and more upstream and sell it as an earlier approach to care um, that would benefit people with progressive illness. But we're up against so many, um, you know, societal norms, right? Like death denying, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, palliative care, equaling end of life care, palliative care is really cancer care, palliative care is only for older people, um, palliative care means you're almost dead, whatever, whatever societal norm, you know, it, sometimes I wonder, are we going to get anywhere trying to work backwards? Or is there a way we could be working forwards? Uh, and think about this journey right from the time of diagnosis and stop selling palliative care earlier, early, but sell something else from for a patient and family who get a new diagnosis. Like half the time I want to sell palliative care and scream at the top of a mountain about how important it is. And the other half of my brain, I say to myself, you know what? We're getting nowhere quickly. We need to start from the start of a diagnosis and have new language, new terminology. That's what we're trying to do with the waiting room revolution. We're trying to position this important way of going through an illness journey with different language so that we don't get all mired down in the definitions. Do you ever struggle that way? <laughs> Yeah, I know that there's that age, age's old debate of should we use another term for palliative care, like supportive care. Um, but I feel like we've, you know, we've put a lot of effort into um, selling palliative care. And my concern is if, if we start using different language, then people will just learn to fear that instead. And they'll start I'm, to see that I'm as actually, anonymous. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not actually thinking about like renaming um, palliative care but just somehow preparing patients and family in a different way mm -hmm. from the beginning without labeling anything 
That's what CN and I are trying to do. We're trying to give them the skills to secretly leech out of the system what they need (laughs) without having to come out and say, I want palliative care or, you know, it's um, when you think, when you tease palliative care apart, um, you know, there are, there are ways we think that patients and families can access that kind of common sense care that you mentioned without Mm -hmm. making even their caregivers, their care providers realize that suddenly we've entered into a discussion that looks very much like a discussion I would have with a palliative care doctor. Yeah. 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 So I think, yeah, absolutely. We need to um, attack attack it from both ends, the, from the time of diagnosis and from the, the end of life, where, as you say, you do the majority of your work. Um, I think one of the um, advantages I have as a geriatrician um, is that I get to see people earlier on in their disease trajectory because um, with the palliative care services that I've worked in, you have to wait to be referred a patient. Yeah. And um, that is often very close to the end of life. Um, Whereas as a geriatrician, um, I can start that palliative approach um, earlier on. And if I'm seeing a patient as a consult, um, I see patients with consults, for example, who need um, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Um, Quite often I identify that actually this person has palliative care needs that really should be um, met by a specialist palliative care service. Um, but no one's made the referral. So I'm able to say, well, don't you think that, you know, this person should be getting referred to the specialist palliative care team um, alongside their rehabilitation? Or sometimes it's um, evident that the person, the reason they've had a functional decline is because they're dying um, and that rehabilitation is not going to help with that. Actually, what they need is um, to readdress their goals of care Mm -hmm. um, and plan for that, plan for, a, a good death um, rather than trying to um, rehabilitate. Well, I, um, you mentioned, Alyssa, that you have this beautiful opportunity as a geriatrician to act and knowing all the skills of mm-hmm. a palliative care doctor of infusing a palliative approach earlier on with your patient population. Mm-hmm. And you get to meet people earlier on, and maybe you get to follow them longer than if you were just doing, you know, palliative care. So what does an early palliative approach look like when you're secretly embedding it into the care of your more upstream patients? What does that look like if you had to put words to what you do, knowing that you're doing both geriatrics and palliative care? I think that it's alongside providing the medical care that's required, for example, with a hospital admission, is um, having those conversations about wishes and future care planning, um, asking what matters most, which is core sort of um, a skill for a geriatrician as well, Um, talking to people about what's important to them and um, trying to achieve that. But being able to do it, you know, earlier on, perhaps when this um, older frail person has a few years left to live rather than when they have a few weeks or days left to live. So it's so interesting because doesn't that seem so simple? Like it's so simple. Like Mm. all we're asking people to do is have open, honest discussions with their patients and families earlier on. That's all. Uh, you know, but when you try to sell a palliative approach earlier, people don't, healthcare providers struggle with, well, I'm not quite sure what you want me to do differently, Mm. (laughs) but really it is, it is about leaning in and having these, um, goal oriented person centered discussions. It really is a lot about communication, palliative Mm. care. You know, the pain and symptom management stuff I tell people is sort of, I don't, I think we'll cut this out, but it's sort of like monkey business. It is what it is, but the sophistication comes around the communication. And that's really what a palliative approach is. It's about having sophisticated communication skills uh, around points of transition or anticipating change 
or, 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 or. Um, it's not that hard, but it's hard to sell. Yeah, I, th I think there's two components. One is you do need to have time. And I think that, um, you know, people don't realise that if you actually have really good conversations and use good communication skills, it can actually save time yes. and be more efficient. Yes. Um, and also, I think that, um, unfortunately, with geriatric medicine, there is a degree of ageism in the community. And I think people aren't outraged. You know, if I'm talking to someone in their 90s about, you know, potentially not um, not offering certain treatments like, you know, intensive care and intubation, um, not that I frame it in that way with them when I have the discussion, but I think that there are some clinicians who would be, you know, I, I can't say that to my young patient with, you know, cancer or whichever organ failure, you know, I'm, that... I'm I'm trying to save lives. <laughs> yeah, that's. And I, I, mean, I think that, that there's whole... more of an acceptance, yeah, for from from the outside of you know a geriatrician having that conversation with their patients because of because of age and and ageism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had doctors who are who understand the palliative approach. Um, we do research about it, and then yet they still say, but when my patients meet me, they want me to be hopeful. Like they don't want me to be so honest. And yet we talked to patients who are like, we, we really did. We didn't, we wanted, we asked several times to try to understand what to expect. And mm. we, we kept getting, you know, dead ended. So it's an interesting, um, it's, yeah. you know, each side is, is saying they're doing it, but neither side is really hearing it. And you talk to patients who are scared of their doctors, um, of letting them down. Yeah. By, you know, oh, I don't want to tell my doctor that I want to stop treatment because I'm worried that, you know, I'll be letting them down or I'm worried they'll tell me off. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure to be a good patient. Yeah, for sure. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Sian. Alyssa, I'm just curious in geriatric training if palliative care is uh, mandatory rotation for all geriatricians. No, it's not. What do you um, think of that? Um, I think or there's a lot of, um, so like I mentioned before, there is a, there's a lot of geriatricians, um, particularly sort of people that are training now or, or finished their training in the last five years or so who have um, done a palliative medicine diploma as part of their training oh. in Australia and New Zealand, which is great. Um, I think that um, it's great to have exposure to it. I'm not sure whether or not we should make it mandatory, though, um, just within the, the bounds of the three-year training program. Um, but it is great to have that exposure and also to have good role models and good teachers in that non-specialist palliative care approach. And it is, you know, it is in our curriculum. There's a lot of things in the curriculum. So, but it is something that you can choose to focus on as well. And I certainly um, always recommend to our registrars that they undertake some communication skills training. We're very fortunate here in Western Australia that um, through our Cancer Council WA, we have subsidised communication skills workshops that are based on the vital talk model using actors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find them invaluable and certainly all the trainees that I've had who have done those have also found them really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you, you bring up a really good point. I always say, um, you know, until we have effective role models within each specialty where registrars or residents can just see a palliative approach happening naturally by the mere fact that I'm doing all these rotations with so many different geriatricians, I see palliative care happening without them knowing they're labeling it or anything. Um, you know, ideally that's the end goal that no one has to do a palliative care rotation with a palliative care specialist like me or you, Alyssa, right? Um, mm -hmm. that they should, if they're a cardiology registrar or resident or a respirology, that they would just see it happening by watching their staff or faculty doing it, right? Uh, yeah. But we know so many of them 
are not seeing that happen in their own specialty. And so until then, you know, one wonders whether or not uh, all people should have to, you know, do a rotation in palliative care, which, you know, could, we could never accommodate that. And again, we don't want people to think you only do palliative care if you're a palliative care specialist. So mm -hmm. again, we find ourselves at uh, between a rock and a hard place again, right? Okay. So, okay. I have two sort of divergent hot topics that I just wanted to pick your brain on, Alyssa. So if I'm not mistaken, Australia actually has a, a little bit of a two-tier system where there's uh, you know, there's clinicians in the public system, but there's also clinicians who work in the private system. And so how does that uh, and so it's a hot topic because in Canada, we're basically uh, mostly a private system and there's discussion of allowing more um, private privatized care. So how has that worked in its impact on receipt or access to palliative care services? Yeah, Having this good question. System? So, yeah, so we have universal public um, health care and then you can also purchase private health insurance. Um, and that offers you, depending on the private health insurance product you purchase, of which there are many, many, um, gives you access to different, um, say, hospital benefits, um, which often includes palliative care. Um, so I think on the, the, the community palliative care service I mentioned, Silver Chain hospice that's only available publicly funded so it's a not-for-profit organization that receives government funding um, so whether or not you have private insurance won't make a difference to your access to community palliative care um, in the uh, outside of western australia in our very uh, sorry outside of the perth in our very vast state um, most of the healthcare is publicly funded there's a couple of private hospitals but again your majority of your palliative care will be um, funded through the public system. Although sometimes it's, we do have some public private partnerships where a private hospital will provide a palliative care service, but the public um, hospital, uh, public um, health system or the, the state government will fund that service. Um, so for the majority of our patients receiving palliative care, um, the big difference would be if um, they have private insurance that there's a few extra options they would have for inpatient palliative care units. Um, and some of their private hospitals, for example, have large um, cancer centres and they would be more likely to be accessing palliative care through the private hospital in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so my other hot topic, because I'm, I'm just looking at the time we're going to run out, but is about physician assisted, assisted death. Is that mm -hmm. legal in Australia? And is that yes. been something that has, it is it is legal and is that controversial? So it's called voluntary assisted dying here. Um, and it's been available um, to Western Australians who fulfill very strict criteria since the 1st of July last year. And I was actually on the ministerial expert panel that looked at the legislation for that and also on the implementation team at the health department, although I'm not a VAD provider myself. So the state of Victoria in, in Australia was the first um, state to legalise voluntary assisted dying. Western Australia was the second state. Um, now we have every state in Australia having legalised it. It's, it's still only available in the two in Victoria and Western Australia at the moment, but it is um, being implemented in other states. And we ha also have territories in Australia and the federal government will decide whether or not voluntary assisted dying is available there. And, and what are the criteria to access it? I'm, I'm assuming they have to be able to consent. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you have to be above 18. You have to be a citizen. Um, you have to have a disease that is likely to, um, so you have to have irremediable suffering um, and then you have to have a essentially a terminal illness that's likely to cause death within the next 12 months, sorry, the next six months, but for uh -huh. a neurodegenerative disease within the next 12 months. 
and you have to maintain your decision making capacity throughout the entire time. Um, so, for example, most people with dementia would never be eligible um, for voluntary assisted dying under our legislation. It's very because it wouldn't be voluntary. Well, I'm curious, the assessors for um, voluntary assisted dying, do they have mandatory standardized training? Yes. So, so they in, can you believe it in Canada? They don't. And yeah. they don't. So Victoria was the first jurisdiction in the world with voluntary assisted dying to have mandatory training. Um, and then Western Australia has followed suit. And yeah, I'll, what I was going to say is when I, when I was a member of the ministerial expert panel for voluntary assisted dying, we did broad consultation a, a, amongst the community um, and stakeholders and different groups and the question that we'd get at every single um, consultation and every time I presented to health professionals, community members alike, is what about people with dementia? And to me, I think that's just a reflection that we don't do end of life care and palliative care well for people with dementia. Yeah. And there's so much scope to improve advanced care planning, advanced health directives. In Western Australia, I think 6% of people dying from dementia get access to specialist palliative care as opposed to 50% of people dying from cancer. So there's a big inequity there. And I, I think that we need to work really hard to improve palliative care and advanced care planning for people with dementia. Um, yeah. And that would help prevent some of those, you know, terrible deaths that people um, have experienced and that people have witnessed their family members experiencing, which is really, you know, why there's such a push um, or why, why there's so much curiosity in the community about why, um, that voluntary assisted dying isn't available to people with dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so many people in my experience who ask for assisted dying are struggling with a lot of the misconceptions that they have about what dying is going to look like and feel like. And once someone sits and has a really open, honest discussion with them about what does and doesn't happen, I have a lot of patients who ask for assisted death who say, oh, I, I had no idea. You're kidding. No one ever told me that. You mean I'm mm. not going to be writhing in pain, choking and suffocating? Really? Because that's why I was asking for assisted dying. I'm terrified of the physical aspect of dying. And so just a heads up to you guys down there, there's a lot of unpacking, as you know, to do around these requests, because often people are asking for made here, but what they're really mm. asking for is, can someone help me? I don't understand what's going on. And I feel so desperate. I want to die. I'm so scared. Mm. It, it's scares and fears. Mm. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, what we're doing is helping people mm. find their um, foothold or grounding in an illness where they have felt upside down. Alyssa, what are you most excited about for the future, especially new things happening in Australia? So okay. much um, going on here, like the compassionate communities and public health palliative care um, is getting a lot of airtime recently. Here. Yeah, I think it's very connected. It's very important, I think, to 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 communities are the key. I think are the a missing piece that a ne um, yeah neglected piece. I think is fair to say that uh, mm. it's such a it's a social dying is a social event rather than only a medical one for sure. Exactly. Do you guys have death? Do you guys have death doulas or end of life doulas in Australia? Yeah, it's a growing sort of thing here. Actually, I think Palliative Care Australia is working on a sort of position statement about it at the moment. Yeah. Another yeah. group that would meet people upstream potentially, but I think depending on how they're funded, they do often get to meet people at the end, but another group that could um, have synergies with geriatricians to be able to help people have these conversations, the time to have the conversations and help people plan out and understand what to expect. I think that's- Yeah, we actually just um, released a new advanced health directive here last week in Western Australia, which is really good as well. So what is talk what, about that, but. yeah let's talk tell me no we have it right now so what what is what is that about what is in that advanced health directive um so we we had an advanced health directive since about 2009 which um is when we first introduced that legislation here 
and it, we released a new one last week or well, the health department released a new advanced health directive it's a much better version it has a value statement so if people don't necessarily feel they're at the point of making um, decisions about specific medical treatments that they might consent or refuse consent to they can have a, a value statement um, about what's important to them and that can help their family and their health providers to guide treatment um, and there's also capacity now for an advanced care plan for people who no longer have the full decision making capacity to make a statutory advanced health directive but they can still get their wishes down in an advanced care plan so those are two of the big improvements and there's some education that's being rolled out by um, our health department as well for health professionals and importantly for the community about this and really trying to get people I guess starting their advanced care planning um, perhaps when they're well but certainly at certain triggers like um, when they go to their general practitioner and get an over 75 health check yeah that's a, or if yeah, they're that's diagnosed a with a new illness or, or something changes yeah so in the advanced care plan is that mean mm -hmm. there um, is that legally binding in the future or it's just a, a, a it's not notation. legally blind not legally binding because the person making it doesn't have the decision making capacity um, but they can be supported I guess to make some decisions and certainly the um, their caregiver their family caregiver can assist with that as well we're almost at the end of time Alyssa um, what advice do you have for patients and families who are just starting on a life-changing diagnosis? I think um, don't be afraid to ask questions, um, reach out to um, community members, reach out to the peak bodies, um, for example, disease groups, um, palliative care peak bodies out there um, for support as well that can help you um, try to navigate that healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, and feel empowered. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alyssa. Okay, thank you both. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shilpa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza.